I'm sort of tired of saying I'm getting tired of political season. Really. I mean, it's like a, a, a constant thing, isn't it, Tom? And um, what's interesting is how relevant politics has become for how to play to the wrong crowd. Um, because po politics is a, and the political season has become with these, you know, endless ads. One right after the other, one pro this party, and right after it, the one for the other party, and maybe even a third, and, uh, you know, and who knows who's producing it? Is it a local person who's producing it, or is it one of the national packs? It's like, it's outrageous. And what's fascinating is that it's a sort of never-ending onslaught of how to understand the other side as negatively as possible. Most of the time due to distortion, most of the time misrepresentation is involved. And all of it is to play to the crowd of some amorphous thing called our side in each case. And it's, it's a good opening for us to consider as we see Paul the Apostle talking to us about um, what it means to play to the crowd of human beings and of human interests, whether while at the same time we are called to play to an audience that is much, far more transcendent and yet far more loving and far more present in our lives, and that is the crowd, the audience of Almighty God. I want to turn first to look at Matthew 22. Because there is a really tough chap chapter of Scripture. You have this path that begins with um, a great banquet, and we've heard of this story in different versions. Um, certainly Luke's version is quite different. And it's sort of a complicated process that the invitation goes out to those who are allegedly worthy to be invited to the banquet, but who don't really give a hoot about that banquet and go on their ways and sort of stimulate the ire of the host of the banquet who says, go out and drag in other people then. Those who consider themselves worthy don't want to come, but let's go to the ones that they would consider to be unworthy and invite them in. But then at the end, it's this strange little scene where Jesus, or not Jesus, but the host of the banquet says, um, why didn't you wear the right clothing to the banquet? And, you need to be tossed out to the outer fire. It's this strange story of trying to figure out who are the called ones, who are the chosen ones, who are the rejected ones, who are the ones that are cast out. Um, it starts the chapter that way. Then we move into this sort of enigmatic story in which Jesus is asked, and they're trying to challenge him constantly at this point now, various different religious groups, um, asking Jesus whether it's right to pay taxes to Caesar. And this is a passage that's fascinating because it's repeatedly seen as being, giving some sort of definitive answer when, in fact, Jesus basically gives a non-answer. Um, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, or render unto God what is God's. And we believe in the sovereignty of God, so even what is rendered unto Caesar is technically God's. So what does that mean? And it's a puzzle. He answers with a non-answer, and they're amazed. And then there's this strange question that the Sadducees put to him, about what happens if you have a series of people, um, a series of husbands who uh, assume their responsibilities when their brother has died to become the spouse to the surviving sister and so forth, multiple times. Who is the husband of this woman in the life to come? And Jesus basically says, well, uh, the resurrection is sort of a different reality that's irrelevant. And after the story we'll focus on right now, there's this question about how David, how the Messiah could be the son of David, when at the same time David is rendered as worshiping the son. Um, this is a, it's sort of a, I wouldn't say it's a terrible thing to say, mess of a chapter, but it's a, a, a confusing chapter filled with issues of debate and discussion that distract us. And the core, it seems to me, is what we hear in the passage today. What is the great commandment? What's the great responsibility? And honestly, what's the tough stuff? And that is to be loving people. So we get in this passage, this call, this invitation. Okay, Jesus, what's, what are we to do? How are we supposed to live? What's supposed to be guiding our lives? And Jesus says two things, two love statements. Love God, 
love your neighbor even as you love yourself. One love commandment and a two-part second commandment. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. You assemble anything else after that and it better pass the test of those. You try to assemble lives in addition to those two and they need to bear, they need to be able to survive the test of love. If they're not loving, they're not legal in so many, in so many ways. All of the law and the prophets has to be tested by these. They hinge on those. And so what that means is our audience, when we're loving people, is God. If you want to be living, and if I want to be living my life so that I'm serving God, love better be the guiding principle. Any love and lifestyle that's apart from that standard, you're outside of the, of the, the tent of Almighty God's expectation. It's a really clear, clarifying statement in the midst of a chapter that's terribly complicated. Now, I find that... First Thessalonians passage to be one of the most meaningful passages. I mean, as God had forgotten, with God as my witness, is where we get that from this chapter. We see that used in so many different contexts, in fiction and, and entertainment. Um, that can get brought up in various contexts. But Paul's ministry at Thessalon uh, Thessalonica is one basically of choosing one audience over the other. And in these verses, we hear him saying, how he's choosing against the human audience. Um, there's great opposition that he provokes. He's rejecting strategies of deceit, trickery, impure motives, um, flattery, greed, seeking human praise. And he basically says he would not seek to please humanity. And then he offers the God audience perspective, that, the, that he seeks to be approved by God, that he's been entrusted by God with the gospel, that he seeks to please God, that he sees God as the tester of his heart, that he sees God as the witness that he's concerned about. If he's in some court of justice, ultimate justice, the one he wants on his side is the God of the universe. That's the witness he's concerned about. And it has consequences for his behavior. He came full-spirited to them. There's a verse that says, I did not come to you in vain. When you say in vain, you're talking about emptiness. You don't have anything that's motivated. You're just like, you know, the sail and flag being blown, whatever direction. I have a depth, basically, of spirit rootedness, what Paul is saying. I did not come empty to you. Um, the spirit is behind it. The courage that is rooted in our God. With that courage I came to you. I brought you good news. It's not easy news, necessarily, but it's good news. Um, I brought deep care to you. I thought I sought to be a gentle presence in your midst. It's good news. It can be sometimes difficult, but it can be offered and lived out and embodied and encountered in a gentle way. Deep care is a part of it. And being one who shared of himself with integrity, authenticity, is a part of it. And wow, that's an amazing thing to consider. When we choose to take that path of love versus just not thinking about it and the consequences it can have for life. I mean, as it is, politics in, 19, in 2014, it is so mystifying, you almost think you're in 19, whatever. But it's almost completely playing to the human crowd. And that's the way it is, but how could it? I mean, what's the possibility? I mean, isn't it possible for there to be something like a God-centered politics? Or at least this. Candidates not acting as if they were God. Um, acting as if they were perfect. Acting, acting as if they do have all the answers and that the other side doesn't. I mean, th there's something innately deceitful in that because they know that's not true most. But what if we have ones who were willing to, to take the step of realizing limitation and acknowledging the other's viewpoint. How about if we replaced debates with thoughtful conversations? How about if we actually honestly dealt with the issues? 
and, and said precisely what it was, what are the values, what are the things that I believe about the range of issues that is my guiding set of principles. And that's the reason that I vote the way I do in Congress or in the state legislature or in the uh, board of commissioners of the county or the city council. I, I do that because this is the way I think and this is what life has taught me. I, that would really be interesting to me to hear. As it is, they, they look like a bunch of fools versus offering their viewpoints. Each candidate being given the opportunity to lay that out, also this, this demand. Each candidate being required to listen to the other respectfully offer their viewpoints. Weighing them, acknowledging where the strengths are and the weaknesses. I mean, I'd be willing to vote for someone like that, who actually was honestly doing that. Notice this deceit, trickery, impurity, flattery, greed, um, seeking out of human praise. But somehow a self-giving, self-open love towards the other. Strengths and weaknesses acknowledged. Strengths and weaknesses acknowledged on the other side. Could democracy survive that? I mean, do we allow it to? Will, will faithfulness be present if it's not there? Well, it is. It's calling us all. It's calling the political situation. I just throw that out there because we're in it. But the practice of grace is something that we are all called to. I mean, it's easy to point to the people that are in the media all the time. Put yourself in the media, in a sense. Put yourself in that area. And only the inexper inexperienced will say that this is an easy thing. That grace is an easy thing to bear. And you've got to do it starting at home. Um, I was on an hour conference call with my two siblings yesterday, on the day before my mother's birthday today, which is her 84th birthday. And she continues her descent into dementia. And I'm telling you that being gracious to one another as a sibling, siblings is really tough stuff. Um, but you know, it's at those difficult times that it matters, that allowing grace to be the governing spirit is the important thing. William Steinberg, one of my favorite heroes, had a quote that I've used before and I've always misunderstood it, by the way. <laughs> he said this, he said, um, the more they dance, the quieter I stand. And I always thought, yeah, he's conductor. I always thought he was talking about whenever the orchestra was dancing, sorry about that. When the orchestra was dancing and dancing and dancing with the music, the quieter he stood. No, this was a political statement related to his fellow conductors, sort of the Bernstein ilk and so forth, who were all over the podium. And uh, he was very understated in his conducting. And basically what he was saying is that I get out of the way of the music. Allow the music to do it. I'm not making any sound. They are. So I get out of their way to allow them to create the beauty. And there's a sense in which to be gracious people, we've got to get out of the way of the spirit of grace to work through. We have to say to ourselves, this part of myself that I'm seeking to offer here is getting into the way, that is the non-gracious self, is getting in the way of grace to operate in my life and to have an impact on other people. And it's very important for us to consider those relationships that we have a hard time with. Grace is easy whenever you get along with people. <laughs> when people think the same way you do, have the same interests and so forth, that's not tough work most of the time. It's whenever we have difficulty with people that, that we have to consider where it is that we are barriers to the Spirit, that we are quenching the Spirit rather than being ones who allow it to work. And I think this is kind of the question you've got to ask. Which relationships in your life have you written off? Is that basic? Agape, that's the great word for love, Greek word for love, self-giving love is no longer operative in those relationships. The pain, the resentment, the hatred even, perhaps the apathy is so deep that you no longer think or wish for the well-being of that other person. And there can be a range of reasons. Now listen, I'm not talking about getting back to a hug and, and perhaps a, a very intimate relationship, a hug-kiss sort of thing in, in the midst of brokenness, but I am thinking about what it is in our, in our relationship to others who are problems in, in our ability to live life with contentment and peacefully. How do we stand in, in our attitude toward them? 
is the gentleness of thought, the gentleness and care that we may have once had, but perhaps never have had. His gentleness and careful, compassionate spirit is that far away from us in those relationships. If they are, that's, those are the relationships that I know, I can name, that have to be on my agenda. It's a matter of the heart. And that's the great thing about the second love commandment. We're to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Do you love yourself? I wasn't allowed to ask that as a kid. Um, loving myself meant I was being self-absorbed versus self-aware of whether I felt all right about who I was as a person. Jesus is asking us to love self and love our neighbors out of that. You hate yourself. What are you doing to your neighbors? You're laying that attitude on them at some level. Do you love yourself? It's a serious question. You know, resentment, pain, guilt, failure, hatred, apathy, they're all deadly to self love The second commandment is to ask what the state of affairs is so that you know what you're doing in relationship to your neighbor. People who love, who are gentle and gracious to themselves, don't write others off. Why? It's because of the first law commandment. They know that they, they love God because God loves them. That God offers grace perpetually to them. God has not written us off. And because of that, that gives me this glimmer of hope that somehow I can have a loving, gracious presence in the lives of other people. That, that, and it's sometimes it's like you know nails on the end of a cliff. It's only that that's holding me on to that love. That somehow. The love of Christ is sufficient. When you believe, as 1 Peter 4 tells us, when you believe God, God's grace expresses itself in countless ways, manifold ways, 1 Peter says, even finding its way to me and to you. You don't ask, should I serve Christ? Should I work for the cause of Christ? You ask, when and where and how? And, when, and, and, and right now, okay, I'll, I'll go. You know, there, there's that impulse that whenever we consider grace. And I'd like to, as I, as I close my thoughts today, I'd like you to consider the idea of an elevator tower. Those of you who've been in business or know anyone in business know about this. I only heard about it about 10 years ago. Elevator tax what you tell people once you walk onto the elevator in a building, tell them about what, you're, what you do your meaning in life by the time you get to your floor. You have no more time to talk. And it struck me that one way to get at that was to look at mottos and sayings that govern different organizations. And so I went online and found a site that has 27 pages of these sayings. I'll just read 25 of those pages. <laughs> Honestly, this uh, For those Swedes among you, the Swedish Academy has this motto, talent and taste. The University of Hawaii has this one, which I think is pretty powerful. Above all nations is humanity. Minneapolis Police Force has this one. To protect with courage, to serve with compassion. That's pretty good. And one of our local congregations has something like this. Love God, love people, period. And I sort of like that, but that period's always struck me as sort of smug. And also not quite true. Love God, love humanity. Um, today, every day, every moment, now. Not a future aspiration. The world needs it now. Brokenness is here now. And so I ask you to consider what's your elevator talk? What I'm working with is this. I will seek, now I'm saying seek, now I'm saying successful. I will seek to live a life empowered by grace and join others in doing the same. I will seek to live a life empowered by grace and join others in doing the same. It's one way to put it, I think. But I'll tell you, it's my attempt today to choose an audience, to reject the terrible temptation to choose inadequate human audiences and to go with the one that matters. And that is the one of our gracious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray.
this day, O oh God, we ask that you continue to probe at us, continue to offer the gentle, welcoming, hospitable presence of your gracious Spirit. And Lord, may this be the day that the hard shell covering our wills would be softened and changed and released for your purposes. We ask it all in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.